Uh, welcome everyone to this Monash Cybersecurity Seminar. Today we are happy to welcome Kipeng Liu, uh, who is a Simon's Quantum Postdoctoral Fellow, hosted by Shafi Goldwasser and Umesh Warizani. Uh, Kipeng got his PhD degree at Princeton University in 2021 under the supervision of Professor Mark Sendry. And uh, Kipeng is interested uh, in quantum cryptography, including both post quantum security and quantum protocols. And today he will talk to us about beating classical impossibility of position verification. And thank you very much, Kipeng. And the scene is yours. Thank you. So uh, let me share my slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, all good. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. So Today I will talk about the work uh, beating classical impossib uh, impossibility of position verification. This is a joint work with Jiahui Liu and Luo Wenqian. So uh, the task of position verification is to verify one's geographical location in a cryptography secure way. So um, here cryptographic secure means being secure without uh, making hardware assumptions, like having access to a GPS and also assume the GPS hardware not being hacked. So you may ask uh, why, we, why we do not use GPS. So there are a couple of reasons. So first for cryptographers, hardware assumptions are usually considered uh, less preferable than computational assumptions. And second, in some situations, such hardware is not accessible. So um, in one extreme example, the prover, which, we will be, um, which will be denoted as an astronaut, tries to convince the verifier well, the verifier denotes the, uh, the people on Earth. That is, the, uh, the uh, astronaut is actually on Mars and building a planet, uh, is building a, blade, a base, instead of uh, taking a vacation on Jupiter. And in this um, situation- think, I think we are mm -hmm. seeing the first slide still, or at least I'm seeing the first slide. Okay, yes, it's still the first slide. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, right. yes, yes. You, 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 you will see the, the next slide uh, like in, a, in a couple of minutes. Okay, okay, so perfect. yeah, yeah, sure. This is just like a motivation. Yeah. So in the situation, you you may need like high security, and you don't you don't have access to GPS. And besides this very extreme example, position verification will also be very useful in, for example, much smaller scale application. If one wants very high security or want to uh, achieve security without trusting the hardware. So uh, okay, so let's start by uh, one method which is called a uh, distance bounding. So informally, it is the following. Here we have uh, one verifier denoted as this uh, yellow guy. This is the uh, verifier B, uh, being on the earth and wants to know where the prover is. So what he could do is to send a message. And if the astronaut uh, responds within a certain amount of time, then he is certain that the astronaut must be within uh, this region. For example, the verifier can send a random ambit uh, message and help it receive the exact same message within a certain amount of time. And this is guaranteed by no faster than light communication principle of the special relativity. So if uh, we, we can simply put like uh, two verifiers, I put another yellow guy here. And if both verifiers can receive their random message within a certain amount of time, then they must know that the astronaut uh, lies in their intersection. And in this example, the astronaut should be uh, here. So in order to improve the accuracy, what you could do is to just have multiple verifiers and repeat this procedure, uh, this process that you can figure out where the prover is at the end. So uh, this is like a simple example of how we do, uh, how we do uh, GPS and how we do position verification using the method called uh, distance bound. But however, there's an issue with this approach. The issue is that uh, if there are multiple adversaries then they are, and they are colluding, then they can incorrectly convince the verifier. So let's uh, look at the, uh, this example. So in this example, we still have this two yellow guy here and we have one malicious adversary who is actually lying uh, in the boundary, but it's not in the, in the intersection. So this adversary can convince the left verifier. And meanwhile, we have another adversary who is on the other boundary and not also not in the intersection. And this adversary can convince the right verifier. 
So uh, in this example, they can commit both verifiers, uh, but actually none of them are even close to this intersection. So with colluding adversaries, this, uh, this uh, simple idea are broke. So um, for the simplicity, uh, let's uh, focus on the one dimensional case. And we're going to uh, look at this diagram. So in this diagram, we have two axes uh, uh, being X and T. So the horizontal axis, which is the uh, X axis uh, represents the location and the vertical axis represents uh, time. So uh, time goes on as you go up in this diagram. And furthermore, uh, all the messages uh, travel at speed of light. So let's say uh, there are a prover and two verifiers. Well, the prover being the astronaut. And the prover, uh, for simplicity, let's assume the prover, which is the astronaut, lies in the middle of these two verifiers. So the verifier wants to convince the uh, the prover wants to convince the verifier that he is at the uh, he is in the middle, and without loss of generality. Um, uh, uh, we can um, we can assume that uh, this uh, verifier uh, this prover is at the location x equals to one. So this uh, verifier uh, the left verifier send a message m zero to the to the prover, and similarly this uh, right verifier sends another message to the prover. And then uh, the timing is made so that these two messages arrive at the prover in the middle at the same time. And when the prover receives both message, it is going to uh, compute some functions of both M0 and M1. And then it sends outcome to both verifier. At the end, both verifier checks if they receive the response on time and if both response are computed correctly. So this is like a general. Um, so this is like a general framework of how position verification could uh, look like. Uh, sorry, something wrong with the slide. Okay. So uh, this essentially requires the astronaut to be in the middle and be able to compute the answer R on time. So if it is to the left of the claimed position, then it should not be able to send this response R to the uh, right verifier on time. And similarly, for the case that it is uh, to the right of the claim the position, it cannot send the response R to the left verifier on time. However, for such a uh, general approach, there is actually a very generic attack, which can rule out all possible uh, position verification. And this is like the, uh, the uh, uh, impossibility result we would like to uh, look at. So uh, here's the generic attack. So think about the following scenario. There are two adversaries. None of them is in the claimed position. Uh, so one adversary is in the middle of the left verifier and the claimed position. So which is uh, this verifier. And the other verifier is similarly uh, C to the next of the claimed position. So, what this, uh, this adversary can do is it can simply remember the message M0 and forward the same message M0 to the right adversary. And similarly, for the other adversary, which is the adversary uh, to, the, uh, to the right, it can also uh, remember the message itself and forward the message. And therefore, this function, since we know that this is like a classical function, they can both compute R correctly on time. And furthermore, um, we assume this f is like a deterministic function, but f can always be made to be a randomized function. And this attack still holds. This is because adversary can pressure some random coins and therefore they can de-randomize this function and make this uh, general attack still works for uh, even if this function is a randomized function. And finally, this attack works even if we assume some computational assumptions like factoring or learning with errors, as long as this function is the classical function. And this is basically followed from the same reason as the adversary can keep uh, this input for itself and forward the input to the other adversary. 
And therefore, this impossibility is quite general and hold for all classical scheme, regardless of uh, whether computational assumptions are made or whether this function is a randomized function or a deterministic function. So uh, this is the, the first part. So um, given this impossibility, um, Jipin, thought, can I ask a mm -hmm. question? Yep. Yep. For the, for the slide. So yep. can this f function depend on a secret that only this astronaut and this uh, this yellow guys know? Uh, sorry. The question yeah, is: Can can the function depend on um, the secret? Yeah. That only that's only known by the astronaut and this yellow guys. Only known by the astronaut. Yeah, and uh, the yellow guys. So that the adversary doesn't know that secret. Oh, uh, the adversary doesn't know the the. Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it can be the case. It can be anything as long as um this is like a classical computable function because this uh these two adversaries as long as this is a function about m zero m one so they can do like similar things by uh forwarding this message and keep a copy by itself and then when uh the time when it comes to this time point they can compute the function by their own. So though it's there's like, as long as it's like a, a classical computable function, it is fine. Yeah. So it's basically rule out all possible uh, uh, classical uh, protocols, yes. Uh, because even if, do we assume that the adversary will also get a hold of the secret at some point? Uh, oh, you're saying maybe the astronaut knows some secret, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in that case, if, if there's okay, so uh, so what I just des described is uh, assuming the astronaut being malicious. So in that case, oh. there's like no no secret. But if you in, in your model, I believe there should be something we can do. Um, yes, I think if you assume adversary doesn't know some secret, which only the honest astronaut uh, does, then I think there should be some way to get around this impossibility. But I think. Um, here, security. So, in our model, security is more about uh, make sure the honest astronaut is not going to do anything uh, malicious. It's going to deviate from his location to like move around. So, so you need to assume the astronaut can be malicious. In that case, there's no secret anymore, right? Yeah. 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 I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. But I think in in, in so the model you propose also it also makes sense and. I believe, although I'm I'm not like 100% sure, but I believe it's, it's doable. Okay. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so Can this- I have uh, a follow-up question? On that? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, so I think the, the, the model you are describing, I think, and the attack Muhammad says, I think it mm -hmm. still goes through. It doesn't go through if, for example, uh, the secret is only known by the, ver by the verifiers, right? By the yellow- uh, mm -hmm. The yellow guy, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, because because the R is only computable by M0 and M1, and F mm -hmm. is, F depends on that secret. So if secret mm -hmm. is not known by the adversary, this um, th there might mm -hmm. be a possible position verification algorithm, right? Yeah, I believe so. If there's, it, it's actually saying that there's some, uh, there's another input which is not known by the malicious uh, yeah. parties. But like yeah. a, like a pre-shared key, maybe. Yeah, something like that, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Just just to just to um just to emphasize here, uh, uh our so in, in this talk we're more focusing on prevent this uh like honest astronaut uh being malicious. Like for example, he called his friend and they they trying to um uh, they basically become two malicious adversaries and can do something bad. Okay, so this is the uh, position verification impossibility, and um, we know like like uh, this is a work uh, come out like twenty years ago. So um, let's uh, look at the state of the art for position verification. So the first is the impossibility we just talked about in the last two slides. This is given by the work uh, by Chandran et al. And besides this impossibility, they also show that by assuming the adversary. Uh, are, are with some bonded storage, there are secure position verification protocols. So instead of making assumptions on the running time, they make assumptions on the maximum working memory or the, or the, or the space. So starting with the work by Kent, almost all other secure position verification protocol requires the power of quantum information. 
basically the quantum information is to use to uh, overcome the barrier in the impossibility result. And we will explain that later. So, and in particular, they all use quantum communication. In other words, uh, instead of uh, sending the message M0, M1 as classical messages, they're sending them as quantum messages. Uh, okay. And um, this inspired the idea in our, in our work. And we finally show how to get rid of the quantum messages. And we just need to use classical messages and still get rid of the classical impossibility. So it looks like it's a, like a contradiction because how is it that possible that there's like impossibility results for classical uh, scheme, but we can still achieve that with classical communication. And you will see uh, the reason um, in this talk. So in this talk, we show that if we assume that learning with errors is hard against quantum computers, then we can construct secure position verification against efficient quantum adversaries. And in particular, this means that the um, verifiers are entirely classical. And also the communication is uh, classical. The verifier do not possess any quantum computational power. And um, recall that in all the previous works, the verifier need to, uh, need to the, need the ability to prepare and some send quantum states. But in our protocol, only the prover needs to do some amount of quantum computation. And that's the, uh, the place well, uh, we, the place we um, have some amount of quantum and, and uh, does not fall into the classical impossibility result. So, and from the previous impossibility result, we can conclude that this quantum computation for the prover is minimum. And the natural question is whether we can do better. Can we do it without assuming computational assumptions? And we also show that for a classical uh, verifiable protocol, you must have a quantum prover. And in particular, this kind of protocol would also imply the existence of what is known as proof of quantumness. And therefore, you have to assume some computational assumptions. And therefore, this also complements uh, our result by saying a uh, certain amount of post-quantum assumptions is required to make position verification uh, protocol with only classical communications. So uh, before move to the construction, let me first uh, motivate why it is a good idea to have classical communication from a practical perspective. So the uh, most important thing for position, for, uh, position verification is that uh, the only reasonable model of computation is wireless communication or uh, something called free space communication. So, but a feature of uh, free space communication is that they inherently have high loss. So this is especially an issue when you are sending quantum messages due to the nature of quantum state. So starting with the work of uh, Chi and Silksis, they show that uh, all known quantum position verification protocol actually break down when the loss is high. And following that work, there's also a few works that study loss uh, tolerant quantum position verifications. Well, they essentially raise the threshold of the loss in which the position verification protocol will still work. And furthermore, there are also uh, these two works showing full uh, loss tolerance, but they only show the security for unentangled provers. So uh, for those who are not familiar with quantum, unentangled adversaries are not the model for, uh, general, uh, for general quantum adversaries. And indeed, um, entangled adversaries can achieve much better advantage than unentangled ones. But for this talk, we will uh, simply focus on unentangled adversaries and just to uh, keep our core idea clear. And we can notice that all this issue, including this uh, loss, um, uh, can be, uh, you can notice that like, all these issues will not exist if we only consider classical communication and this is because for uh, classical communications, we can simply repeat the message multiple times, or we can use any error correcting codes. And the same idea will be complicated if we want to uh, uh, use that for quantum information or quantum messages. So this is the first motivation of using classical communication. And um, further motivation is that uh, in practice, you, um, they usually use a tracking laser to send directed quantum messages. And this is something not very efficient and they require very, very high accuracy. So 
um, with classical message, we can simply broadcast a message and we can um, have, uh, yeah. And, and it also will be more difficult if you want to compose the uh, position verification with other properties. For example, the astronaut wants to know if the message is sent uh, from an honest prover. For example, if the message is sent from the command center from the Earth. So this protects the privacy of the astronaut, astronaut from anyone who is not the verifier. So one direct solution is to simply sign the message, but it will be subtle if you want to authenticate quantum messages. But since we're using classical communication, we can easily sign the message using any existing post-quantum signature schemes. Okay. So um, this is the, the first part. So uh, first let's um, looking at this uh, position verification using quantum communication. So this is uh, basically sending quantum states. And to understand this part, the only quantum knowledge you need to have is the so-called no cloning theorem. So the no cloning theorem uh, or principle of quantum mechanics says that uh, quantum information cannot be generally copied. So classically, it is easy since if I give you a, a piece of classical information, you can simply read each bit of the classical message and write the message twice. But it turns out that in a quantum world, if you do not know this uh, state, you cannot copy a general quantum state. So let's uh, look uh, back to this diagram. The astronaut now will use a measurement device to uh, measure a photon. We will specify this later. This photon is actually this, uh, the algorithm or the, the function it actually uh, wants to compute in the classical uh, in the classical case. We're looking at this example with only one message being quantum. And in particular, this message, uh, this is the message sent from the left verifier. This message is encoded as the BV84 state. So uh, roughly speaking, the state encodes the underlying bit B. Here you see there's like a cat of B with some basis information theta. So if one does not know this theta, this, uh, even if it gets the state, the whole state H to the theta B, um, it can neither learn the bit B nor copy the state with small errors. And the other verifier will send the basis information theta to the measurement devices. And the prover in the middle, upon receiving this basis information, it learns how to measure this state. It then measures the state in the right basis, which is specified by uh, this bit B, uh, this bit theta, and the learn B with certainty. And then it's going to uh, report the measurement result to both verifiers. And finally, both verifier can check if the prover recovers correct bit. And this is the uh, basically most of the previous uh, position verification protocol based on this is uh, based on BB84 state. So if we look back to the uh, classical impossibility result, we'll uh, see how it overcomes that impossibility. So record that uh, this, this figure. And also we record the no cloning theorem. It says that if you do not know a quantum state, you cannot clone that state. So for this uh, previous generic attack, um, uh, let's, let's uh, focus on the left uh, adversary. So the left adversary, uh, supposed to recover this message and forward the message to the adversary at the same time. So with the no cloning theorem, we know that uh, on a high level, since it does not know the basis uh, information theta for this quantum state, it can not learn the information B and it cannot copy this information. So basically what it can do is either keep this quantum state for himself or for this quantum state to the adversary on the, on the right, but it cannot do uh, both at the same time. So this uh, high level idea basically get, uh, get uh, overcome that barrier in the classical impossibility result. And this argument can made formal. One can show that um, uh, with, this, with this scheme, uh, this protocol is sound uh, with, prob uh, with uh, probability roughly uh, like uh, uh, something uh, more than a half, but less than one. And then we can 
uh, do a parallel repetition by sending a multiple of such BB84 state and multiple of basis information and prove that with such a parallel repetition, uh, no adversary, even if they are uh, bounded, can win more than some exponentially small probability. And this is the uh, previous uh, position verification protocol with quantum, uh, with quantum messages. Okay. So, okay. so uh, the previous protocol basically gets around this impossibility result by making the function taking quantum inputs. So remember uh, in the impossibility result, both, uh, both adversaries are, uh, 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 keep a copy of the input and also forward the copies. So it inspires us that we need to uh, make the function inherently quantum. And in the previous example, uh, in the previous uh, position verification protocol with quantum messages, what they do is they uh, make this input quantum, right? They make this M0 quantum. And therefore, at least one of the adversary cannot uh, copy these messages. And in this work, we actually employ a, um, employ a different idea to make this function f inherently quantum and uh, get rid of this impossibility. In the meanwhile, we can still keep all the inputs classical, which still makes m0 and m1 classical and also both uh, response classical. And therefore the whole protocol will only uh, require classical communications. So it comes to uh, our construction. And so before uh, introducing our construction, we will uh, rely on the following primitive called trapdoor Clawfrey functions. And I will uh, briefly uh, talk about that here. So uh, the, uh, the trapdoor Clawfrey function is a hash function that takes the public key and the maps n bits to n bits. It has uh, several properties. The first one is called a uh, claw free, meaning it is a two to one function. And it is hard uh, for any efficient adversary to find collisions. And besides, uh, for every public key, there's a trapdoor paired with that public key. And with that trapdoor, you can efficiently invert any images and figure out both x0 and x1, which are uh, the only two pre-images of this image one. And furthermore, we will talk about uh, another property which will be extremely useful in our construction called adaptive hardcore bit property. And we will explain this in the next slide we are combining this with another protocol called proof of quantumness. So uh, here we will explain the concept of proof quantumness for the purpose of explaining adaptive hardcore bit. This will be uh, very important to our construction. So if you have any question, feel free to uh, stop. So this protocol called proof of quantumness is introduced by Brakersky et al. It is an interactive protocol between a classical verifier and a quantum prover. This is built on the uh, trapdoor clawfrey function we just introduced. This protocol goes like the following. The verifier samples a public key PK together with the trapdoor, which is uh, the trapdoor paired with this public key. It then sends this public key to the prover. And the quantum prover upon taking this public key, it computes the function F of uh, the public key coherently on, up, on, on all possible inputs and measure the output register. And this will give him a classical image, Y, together with the superposition of two pre-images, which are the pre-images of uh, uh, both pre-images of the image Y. And it forwards the image Y to the, uh, to the verifier. And for those who are not familiar with quantum, you may ask uh, what this notation mean. So um, actually you don't need to worry about that. And you can just, just, just simply uh, think about this two quantum state as sigma and sigma y. 
And actually uh, the, the, like their construction and what actually happens does not matter too much. As long as I explain these uh, properties, I think it should be easy for uh, people who even don't uh, quite understand quantum. And therefore you can so think this Y as a commitment. So after you measure this y, the state sigma becomes sigma y, and this y has uh, enough mean entropy, high mean entropy. So you can view this y as a random element in all n bit strings. And then for the verifier who is uh, getting this trapdoor, and after it gets the uh, image y, it can efficiently recover both pre images x0 and x1. And then it samples the random challenge theta which is the random bit being either zero and one. And if theta is zero, the prover need to answer either a pre-image x zero or the pre-image x one. And if theta is one, it needs to uh, provide a string n whose inner product with x zero, x, uh, x or with x one is, is zero. And you can see that for each challenge, the verifier can check if the answer is consistent because the verifier knows both x0 and x1. So if theta is zero, it simply check if this answer is one of these two strings. And if theta is one, the verifier can simply uh, check the inner product. And for a quantum prover, it can always answer this challenge correctly. We will ignore this since it is not the focus of this talk. Just to remember that uh, in this protocol, uh, this protocol has, uh, has completeness for quantum provers. And besides, we have something called a uh, soundness, which says uh, that, that's exactly the adaptive hardcore bit property. So it says that there's no efficient quantum adversary can compute y answer zero for zero challenge and answer one for one challenge simultaneously with probability more than half. So uh, note that it's easy, it is easy to achieve uh, probability half because one can always uh, answer answer zero by um, correctly because it, it, for a class, uh, it can always figure out answer zero correctly. And for answer one, because um, uh, it's a, like an inner product. So you, uh, one can simply get any non-zero guess and it is always correct with probability roughly half. And, and also note that it is easy to produce two different Ys uh, and answer uh, zero for one Y and answer one for the other Y. So as long as these two Ys are different, this adaptive hardcore bit will be easy and, and this cannot be hoped. And this observation will be important later in our construction. The adaptive hardcore bit can be achieved assuming a quantum harness of LWE. So, and, and you may ask why this is called proof of quantumness. It is because if a classical protocol could pass this uh, whole protocol with probability one, then we can always save the working memory. In this case, it is uh, sigma y. Because it's a classical uh, uh, prover, the sigma y will be classical. So what it can do is to simply run uh, the, the protocol with theta equals to zero and the theta equals to one respectively. And since it achieves completeness one, it can always on, uh, figuring out both answer zero and answer one, and therefore break the adaptive hardcore bit property. And since we assume LW is hard, there must be no such classical algorithm can pass this protocol with uh, high probability. So the above reasoning is actually saying something much stronger. It says that besides it's saying the sigma y cannot be classical, it says that the sigma y should not be, uh, should be unclonable. Because if the sigma y is clonable, then we can do the same argument. We can basically uh, copy the sigma y into two copies and we run this protocol with different challenge zero and one, and then we can uh, break this adaptive part for bit property. So, and uh, in the later, uh, in our construction, we will use the fact that this uh, state, this sigma y, after you're measuring y, is unclonable. 
to build our position verification program. So with this, um, all this preparation, here comes our first attempt. So in this attempt, the left uh, verifier sends a public key to the prover. And for the right verifier, it sends theta, which uh, denotes the random challenge. And then this, uh, the, uh, this prover computes uh, say sigma, and then it also computes y and answer. And finally, it sends both the y and the answer to uh, both verifiers. The both verifier checks if the answer is the right answer for this y with respect to the challenge theta. The, the verifier uh, further checks if both y are the same. If not, as we see from the previous discussion, it is easy to prepare answer zero for one y and answer uh, one for different ones. And therefore we need to ensure y being the same. And now let's try to see uh, what an adversary can do. So we look at a similar example. Well, there's a one adversary uh, on the left and another adversary on the right. If they can produce different ways, then we uh, realize that this adversary can simply run this procedure twice and output Y and answer. And this is rather easy since they will get all the information, including the public key and the challenge. So therefore, this is another example showing that uh, these two verifiers need to check this Ys are being uh, identical. So we uh, look at the actual attempted proof. So assume the adversary is performing some honest execution. It takes the public key and it runs the protocol until it, figure, uh, it, until it outputs the classical Y and the leftover state sigma y. As we have seen from the discussion, this sigma y should be unclonable. And therefore, it can either send this to the other adversary or keep it for himself. And therefore, it seems that we can um, use only classical communication and still ensure this prover or this adversary prepare an unclonable state instead of using quantum communication. And it seems to um, capture the high level idea of this quant uh, position verification with quantum, quantum communication by uh, making this adversary preparing an unclonable state for itself. So this protocol seems to mimic the previous pre uh, position verification protocol with quantum communication. But however, uh, the intuition I just described does not quite work. We uh, look at the following attack. So the adversary, instead of prepare uh, a single Y, it now prepares two different Ys. And it also generates answer zero and answer Y for each Y respectively. So it happens right after this left adversary uh, gets this public key. And he can do everything because it's independent of this theta. And then it's, uh, for, and we know that everything here is classical. So it can keep a copy for itself and forward all the information here to the right adversary. And at this time, uh, both adversary will know uh, y0, y1 with answer zero, answer one, together with the information about the challenge, which is theta. And therefore, because they know this theta, they can simply pick y theta and answer theta uh, together, and they can uh, uh, and answer the challenge. And since we know that um, they can, uh, this has like completeness one. If uh, they are, they have quantum, uh, they have quantum power. So uh, by this attack, um, this will completely break the attempt position verification protocol. So our first attempt fell. And you may ask, it already looks very similar to the proof of quantumness protocol. But what actually goes wrong? So let's record the proof of quantumness protocol. Here we have an outcome Y in the second stage. And, and we see that it actually works as a commitment. It commits that 
in the later stage, this quantum prover will answer a challenge with respect to this y. However, in our position verification, this y is not fixed. And this is only revealed at the very end of this game. So in other words, our attempt protocol indeed relies on the game well y and theta is uh, swapped. So, and this is more like the security game our uh, first attempt really based on. In this game, this uh, verifier sends pk and theta to the quantum prover, and the prover will produce y and answer together instead of um, commit on y and then answer the challenge for that theta. So in this uh, modified game, since y is not committed, the prover can prepare two different answers, one for zero and one for challenge one, and they can uh, belong to different images. And this will give no, uh, they will not give any guarantee on sigma y being unclonable. And that's where the problem actually, uh, actually comes from. So let's come back to our first attempt construction. So the previous discussion tells us that the prover needs to somewhat commit to some y instead of having the ability to choose y after theta is revealed. Therefore, in our second attempt, we change the timing constraint a little bit. So the first half of the protocol looks exactly like our first attempt. The left verify sends a public key to the quantum prover. The quantum prover while uh, doing some computation and sends y to both the right, uh, left and the right verifier. But we will slightly change the timing of the challenge. Instead of uh, sending this theta at the very beginning to the, adverse, uh, to the prover, this theta is actually sent a little bit uh, late. And then this prover, upon getting this theta, it generates the answer corresponds to this y and the theta, which will be this answer, and sends both answer to the left verifier and the right verifier. So the verifier will do the normal check, which checks if this answer is the uh, right answers for y with respect to the challenge theta. And also the verifier is going to do another check, which basically check the message y. This y arrives um, on time and before this answer arrives. In other words, this message uh, should not depend on theta. This message uh, y, the commitment should not depend on theta. And therefore it ensures the prover to commit to some y before it, answer, like before it answers any challenge. It turns out that this protocol can be proven secure. So to prove our protocol is secure, we basically rely on another property called uh, computational non-local game of TCF. And this is basically a variant of uh, the non-adaptive uh, uh, hardcore bit property. So let's record the game for proof of quantumness. The verified sending a public key to the uh, quantum prover, the quantum prover responds with some commitment Y and then the verifier sends a random challenge being either zero or one. And finally, the prover sends the answer, which is the response. And in a com uh, computational non-local game, before the challenge sending this random challenge, this prover needs to do something else. The prover needs to split itself into two copies. And split the, basically it splits into two provers which cannot communicate with each other. And then both uh, the challenge will send random but identical challenge to both prover. In other words, this uh, challenge will send a random theta to both of these two provers. Although these two prover cannot communicate it with each other, they need to both come out with an answer. Let's say the answer for the left uh, prover is answer A and answer B for the right prover. And moreover, this prover can be entangled, but let's just uh, ignore this for now. And this is the uh, computational non-local game of TCF. We say this adversary wins the game if and only if 
these two uh, split prover can both uh, simultaneously answer the correct answer, answer the correct uh, response. So in this paper, we show that the success probability of passing both checks simultaneously is at most uh, three halves. And that basically that implies this sigma y is kind of unclonable in this game. And, uh, and in the work, we amplify this soundness by using some existing techniques, which we will talk about that very soon. And then we can uh, doing some kind of parallel repetition and make sure this probability is negligible small. Okay, so, so why, uh, I, I will just give another intuition of why this game uh, is actually true. So we can look at on the left side, it is the computational non-local game game of the TCF. And on the, on the right side, it is the, um, uh, we are going to do a reduction and we want to build an adversary for the uh, adaptive hardcore bit property. So assume on the, on the left side, we have an adversary that, let's say with probability one, breaks this non-local game of TCF. So what we can do is we can turn this adversary, this two adversary into another adversary that can simultaneously answer uh, the, the challenge for zero and one at the same time. So what we do is instead of sending the same theta, we're sending theta equals to zero to the left uh, verifier, to the, to the left uh, malicious prover, and we send theta equals to one to the right prover. And we're getting the response from the left prover and the right prover. And since we know that they can always answer that correctly. This answer A will be the, uh, the correct answer for the zero challenge. And the answer B will be the correct answer for the, for the one challenge. And this will, uh, basically we can simply output this commitment Y together with answer A and answer B. And this is, will be the, uh, be the uh, well, this will break the adaptive part four bit property. And that's basically finished the, uh, the proof of that uh, construction. So I will also mention other results that are achieved in this work. So first, as we mentioned before, this uh, non-local game only achieves soundness roughly uh, three fourths. So in order to uh, achieve negligible soundness, we need to use existing techniques of doing, uh, of doing uh, by doing parallel repetition. And also, um, um, we only, uh, for the previous result, uh, for the, for the first result, we only prove it achieve negligible soundness against unentangled adversaries. So we basically amplify the security by using, uh, existing techniques. And we can show that assuming sub exponential security of LWE, we can achieve security against, uh, entangled adversaries. And also we show that we can achieve, um, uh, adversaries against unbounded entanglement in the quantum random oracle model. And as a complement result, we show that the attack is actually quite general and can be applied to a large collection of, uh, of constructions. And this is basically evidence that to achieve security against entanglement adversaries, we either need to use a random oracle or we need to uh, know the entanglement bound which means we can only achieve bonded entanglement. And for the future directions, there are a couple of interesting questions. The first is um, in this work, we only considered a uh, one dimensional uh, uh, position verification. And this is also um, most of the previ previous work focused on. So the question is, can we do higher dimensional classical uh, verif verifiable position verification? There are a couple of uh, possibilities, but we have not uh, explore, explored them. The other thing is that we've seen that um, there are, um, um, for, as we've seen that with entanglement, uh, adversary can behave much better than unentangled adversary. So it's, um, it's natural to ask the question that if there's some time and entanglement trade-off, that means with more, with more entanglement, can we do better or if, there's some check trade-offs between the running time of the adversary and the entanglement shared with, with, this, uh, with, with these two malicious adversaries. 
And the third point is in our uh, construction, we, uh, if we look back to the picture, um, since we need to change the timing a little bit here, this quantum state need to be kept coherently for uh, some time. Therefore, uh, our construction requires the prover to have a quantum memory for a short amount of time. And the question is, can we uh, get rid of this? Because we know that quantum memory is uh, actually expensive, especially if we want to keep this memory stable for a certain amount of time. So that will be also be an interesting question. And the, uh, the final question is, um, can we weaken the assumption or can we achieve that in an idealized model? For example, random Oracle model without assuming LWE um, uh, or we can based on, let's say just a maybe generic group model to build that. And that's uh, everything I want to talk about today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kipeng, for your very mm -hmm. interesting talk. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, uh, I might uh, start with my question first. I, act mm -hmm. I you actually answered one of my questions in your previous slide. I was going mm -hmm. to ask about this parallel repetition if we can just do it, but you already answered that. I have a similar... uh, I... Can I ask yeah. first because I have to go very soon? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, go ahead. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry, I have to leave very, very soon. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And uh, I have quite a lot of questions, but probably mm -hmm. I will make it short. Um, yeah, sure. So t thanks for the talk. Um, my very first question is um, the assumption on LWE. Yes. Is it is it only used in the proof of quantumness, or you also used it somewhere else? I think towards the very end uh, to go from unentangled uh, adversaries to entangled. Um, is it or the the it's it's actually it's only used for this proof of quantumness. So basically. Uh, so the reason here we, we for uh, for bounded entangled for for bounded entangled adversary we requires a, 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 a even stronger proof of quantumness and that's built from a stronger vote a stronger LWE assumptions. So, yeah. but still, that's only the only place we need LWE. That is based on something like proof of quantumness, or you can think about that's something. Um, um, like, like, like something like uh, this game. Well, you can answer, if you look at this picture, uh, if you can come out with any game, yes, here, any game that's, uh, you can answer one of the challenge, but you cannot answer both challenge. Yeah. Then you can convert that into a position verification protocol. And then you don't need LW, yes. Okay, all right. Um, so um, I, so, so, um, so I think towards uh, somewhere once you were talking about classical, uh, classical ways of doing it and uh, the new results, I think you, you provided another, another attempt or probably another paper mm -hmm. that, um, that there was like a state and there was the computational basis and you were measuring that in middle. Uh, was it a known result or? Yes, this uh, is. The, yeah, let me go back to that slide. Yeah. So I, I'm just wondering what's the exact uh, difference between that result and your result? What, what that one doesn't achieve what that you achieve here? Oh, okay, you yes. So, so for, for this result, the problem yeah, is this is, this is like a quantum communication. So this this particular message uh, is a quantum yes, state, yes, 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 but yes. for our construction, it's like classical. So you can do a lot of things like you can broadcast the classical message, which you cannot broadcast quantum state. You can only okay. send like directed quantum message. Okay. And, or, or you can like sign the message. You can make sure this message is actually sent from your command center instead of sending from yeah. like other malicious parties. Yeah, there yeah. are like a bunch of uh, advantages of making it classical. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. And then uh, probably, probably last, okay, maybe last two questions. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, going from a uh, single dimension to high dimensional results. Do yes. you mean by increasing the dimension of X here? Uh, or, yes. or what is the dimension? So, so you achieve only one dimension uh, security with respect to X and you want to increase it to, for example, vectors and lo like location. X. Yes, so, so in most of the work, 
they all focus on X being a one dimensional space. So things will get uh, even trickier if you, for example, if you consider two dimensional space, because uh, when you have two dimensional space, the intersection will no longer be a point, but it will be yep. something like an area. So uh, yep. for that case, things will be trickier, but there are already some, uh, uh, some works that consider that case. But here we're just like more focusing on the feasibility of making it classical communication. Yeah. So we just like kind of like stop for the uh, one dimensional case and we're not like working towards a higher dimensional. Yeah. Case. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, probably, uh, probably the last one, I promise this is the last one. So mm -hmm. um, I think uh, towards the end, once you produce your, your final result of your final protocol, mm -hmm. uh, you assume that, um, like one of the elements is sent quite a little bit later than the other one, right? Yes. And then you increase also the number of uh, like the computations done by the quantum prover from one to two, right? Uh, you're saying here you need to do two computations instead yes. of one computation. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So, um, so, so, uh, is this is this something inherent to, to your protocol, or you think this can be probably reduced to one? Because you here, also mentioned the problem of quantum memory here. I understand. Yeah. Yes. So here, as we see, so this gap can be any uh, can be so this this time gap can be made arbitrarily small as long as like we have like device to to like with enough accuracy. So the problem is if the theta is sent at the same time, then uh, what I described before, which is this attack will kick in if there's no time gap because yeah. this adversary will receive yeah. kind of like this, this answer, this Y will depend on theta. So we just make an arbitrary small gap such that this Y cannot depend on theta. So, so what, this why will perform like a commitment instead of like it can depend on theta. So uh, th this attack will no longer be uh, available in this, um, in this construction. So I would say this is inherent, but this gap can be made uh, arbitrarily small as long as your uh, device can identify that small gap. You have enough accuracy. Yeah. But, but let me, let me re-ask my question sure. is there any impossibility result that says this, this uh, no this, okay. this and it's only like, artifact of your your yeah, this is, yes this is yeah this is like an artifact for our construction okay yeah. I, see, I see thank you yeah. uh thank you so much uh and uh, thank sorry, you i have to leave uh, mm -hmm. yeah thank you yeah thank you for listening um does anyone else have any questions uh, yes, I have a couple of questions. Yes, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you for the nice, interesting talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, my first question is related to Amin's question about LWE. So, so if you use the QRM model, mm -hmm. uh, do you need? Do you, can you just use standard LWE without some exponential? Yes, if you use quantum random oracle model, then you can just base on a polynomial uh, like, like, like any like a standard LWE and you can still achieve unbounded against any unbounded uh, like okay. entangled okay. adverse rates. Yes, there's okay. like you don't need sub exponential LWE. Okay, okay. Yeah, thanks. So that was the first one. And the second one is, um, yeah, when you when you establish this uh, unclonability, mm -hmm. so the reason why you need this uh, arguments with the repetition and so on is because the because the the, the class I mean the um, the basic unclonability property of of quantum mechanics it only rules out uh, clonability with probability one, right? And here you want to, to rule it out also with even negligible probability or not. Uh, uh, yes, that is true. And actually, if you uh, look, yeah, th th that's one reason. That's like the no cloning theorem is actually quite generic. It is uh, it's like not very easy to use. You really need something like quantitatively uh, 
uh, like quantitative and help like that that can help you help your analysis. So here, uh, if we look at this game, this called like non-local game, we prove that uh, no adversary can win this game with probability at most uh, three fourths. But actually, there's it is tied. This claim is tied. There's a adversary that can indeed achieve this probability. So in other words, it's, it's like uh, at least inherent to, to have this constant probability. So we really, uh, to achieve negligible soundness, we really need to do either sequential or parallel repetition. And that's right. the reason uh, we need to do that. Yeah. And that's inherent for also using, um, but, um, you, you can think about here, theta is like a single bit. So what they can do is they can both, uh, like, like basically what they can do is for theta zero, they can both answer that correctly. And for theta one, they can make the same random guess. So in that case, the probability will be uh, when theta zero is, uh, when theta is zero, they always win. And when theta is one, they win with probability half. So in this case, they, they do achieve three fourths. So that's like, it, this is like why it's uh, three fourths and why we need uh, parallel repetition to, to reduce summits. And is, is, there, um, is there a way to use directly a, a challenge that is multi-bit rather than having to do this repetition? Uh, in, indeed, the repetition is just to make this challenge more than one bit. <laughs> this is what we do, yeah. So we have like uh, like uh, lambda bits. Each bit is independent challenge, and they are ne they need to answer each bit uh, independently, and that will um, make this soundness go to negligible. But then the if you repeat the k times, mm -hmm. uh, then you need also to repeat k answers, right? Yes, exactly. So the complexity will um, go up when you uh, repeat that uh, protocol several times, yes. But the, have, have you looked at protocols that don't increase the complexity? You uh, that's a good question. For this protocol, I think you do need to do that such repetition. As I said before, uh, if you don't, then there's actually, this is like a tight statement, right? So uh, you have no way to reduce it, but I, yeah, I'm not sure if there are other ways we can reduce it without increase the complexity. Mm -hmm. mm, let me see. Yeah, I'm not sure, but that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's all I had. Yeah. yeah I, I had the same question as Ron's last question. I was going to ask if. There's a proof of quantumness with negligible sounds without repetition. Okay, <laughs> I think that was answered already. Um, I think know, usually I guess, you need to do sequential uh, repetition, right? Like to 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 do this, or you yeah, or do parallel repetition to 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 uh, take down the to make the sound is smaller. Yeah. yeah I'm sure. All right. Um, yeah, I guess we don't have. Any more questions? So thank you very much again, Kipeng, for your very yeah. interesting talk. Yeah, and thanks. thank you everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the hope invitation. To see you in the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.